Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty, a very special show today. We talk with Daniel DiMartino, who is a Venezuelan expatriate. He is a fighter for liberty, and he's going to give us an inside look of what it was like growing up in Hugo Chavez's socialist Venezuela. Check it out. Daniel, welcome. Thank you for having me, Mike. Um, before we start, I wanted to to tell a story because one of, one of my favorite novels is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, and at, at the very last closing section of that book, the um, the brains that that the creators, the entrepreneurs, have all piled into a plane and are fleeing Manhattan just as the lights shut out in Manhattan one after another. There's a rolling blackout that takes over Manhattan, and it always seemed kind of uh, dramatic and maybe maybe a little bit overkill that that yeah, that's never going to happen in Manhattan. But just a couple days ago, this happened in Caracas. It happened across Venezuela. It's been happening for a long time. I feel like uh, um, fiction has become reality for your home country of Venezuela. I, I would agree with that. We have had for the last uh, over 10 years a massive brain drain, uh, which is exactly what Ayn Rand was describing, that people who innovate have fled the country because there's no incentive to innovate. And we have seen doctors, we have seen architects, we have seen um, engineers all flee the country because of the measures that Nicolas Maduro and Hugo Chavez did from before. So I would say that, yes, it is It is like Atlas Shrugged, and it is like 1984 too. Yeah. The, the, the massive police state that they have created is, is also like a fiction novel. Unfortunately, all of the dystopian novels that we know, you can, you can pull stories from real time in your home country and, and, and see that happening. Um, let's, let's take a step back and, and let people get to know you a little bit. You were, you were born and raised in Venezuela. Your parents had a small business in Venezuela. Tell me a little bit about your history. Yeah, so I was born in 1999. That's the same year that Hugo Chavez became president of Venezuela. He was elected uh, a few months before in 1998. And ever since I was born, I was raised with a culture of my parents, of entrepreneurs. They owned a gas station in uh, central Venezuela, in La Victoria, Estado de Aragua. And we went from, from being a middle-class family that earned a few thousand dollars a month to being very poor. Uh, Thank God that we already owned our home and, and our car because we wouldn't be able to, to purchase those things in the, if we had just started in, in the mid-2000s. So my grandparents are from Italy and Spain, the parents of my, of my both parents. Uh, from my dad's side, they're Italian. They immigrated to Venezuela in the late 50s, same with, with my mom's side. And they escaped Europe because Italy was destroyed by World War II and Spain by the Spanish Civil War. And Franco in Spain had actually imposed terrible government control measures, price controls, there were shortages of food in Spain. And my granddad actually sent money back to Spain and kept his family of over seven uh, siblings alive just with his remittances from Venezuela. Venezuela was like the American dream where you could save your, your people in, in Europe while working hard and with no education. He didn't even finish primary school. He didn't get even sixth grade, my grandparents. It's funny that your grandparents fled Franco's Spain and Mussolini's Italy to ultimately end up in Venezuela. In Maduro's Venezuela. Yeah. And, and now they are all actually back in Europe. They have had to flee again. And my parents have had to flee again. And they, they fled to, to, to Spain. And I'm here in the United States. So you're, um, how, did, how did you and your family get out of Venezuela? Because famously now there are, there are blockades that prevent uh, particularly poor people, people with no means and they're, you know, they're trying to cross the border to get food, and hopefully we can talk about that a little bit. But, but how did your family escape? So first, I, I was the first person to leave, and it was because I, I wanted to come to the United States, and I had applied to colleges, and my university gave me uh, a scholarship that I couldn't refuse where I don't pay any tuition, and then I work on campus as well. And my parents left a year and a half later. They left in 2017, and they left by they just sold everything they had, everything they could sell. They couldn't sell our business because it's technically government owned now, yeah. uh, which is the gas station. And they left with the few things that they could sell and, and they set up shop in Spain, in Madrid. And they did it so it's easier because we have the Spanish citizenship, right? 
and because we had something to sell and we were we had money for a flight ticket yeah but not everybody has that now it's legal to live it's not like cuba yet that you're penalized from escaping the country but but i'm afraid that we're getting to that point honestly yeah and i mean there's there's a a, a bunch of venezuelan refugees in in colombia now is that right yeah there's over a million and a half and it's very tragic because they come with extreme need and they actually need the government to take care of them initially yeah. because they, they need health care, you know, they have diseases, they need housing. What are they going to do? They need jobs. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny because uh, I, I didn't plan this, but your story is just like Ayn Rand. She was a, a young girl fleeing the Bolshevik revolution in Russia, came to this country without a penny. And, and somehow managed to make a life for herself. There, there may be a story about about the American dream in there somewhere where you, you don't need a lot, but you, you need the ambition to get there and to work hard. And that's what I love about this country. Uh, I specifically wanted to come to America and not go to, go to Europe because I think that the values that this country was founded upon and that continues to live by those values of freedom and equality under the law are are something that is remarkable and that doesn't exist anywhere else. You don't have a huge community of people who are liberty lovers like in the United States, anywhere else in the world. So let's let's watch the devolution of of Chavez's Venezuela through the eyes of your parents because you were you were too young to know how bad it was certainly in the the first years of of the of the regime. I say regime, but you know, he was democratically elected and he 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 made lots of promises appealing to the people. He was going to break up the cartels and and finally democratize Venezuela. But of course, that's not what happened. Tell me about that that devolution and 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 how it got so bad. Yes, he got elected in 1998 democratically, and then he knew that if he was going to stay as a dictator, he needed to change the constitution, which is one of the first things most dictators do. So he appealed to that, you know, our constitution starts with something like the sovereignty is uh, within the people. And even though there was an amendment process established in our constitution, he said that because the people are sovereign, they can just vote a new constitution and completely different. And the Supreme Court made the very, very terrible mistake of accepting that as constitutional. And he called for a referendum. He drafted a new constitution. And with that new constitution, he extended the presidential term. He got reelected again. He allowed for reelection that we did not allow immediate reelection before. And he started then use, passing enabling acts, just like you know many other dictators have done, have done in the past. And with those enabling acts, he started taking away property. One of the first things he took away was land. And as you started seeing those things, uh, food production went down. That's when we had massive protests in 2002. We tried to recall Chavez. And there, there's also massive fraud in the elections after after the first one, and and that's that's how we started going down the drain of socialism. And he promised to take the land from the oligarchs and and redistribute it to the campesinos. That's right, and that never happens, of course. Never happens. <laughs> what happens is that the government just takes it away, and then the government assigns people to manage it. But because there's no profit incentive, it doesn't matter how much you produce; you always get paid the same. Or the government just cares about hiring more people and giving more jobs so that they can get their votes, then none of these enterprises are profitable. I remember because my um, our business or gas station was in La Victoria, it's an hour and a half away from Caracas, and we drive through the highway and we see this huge sign that says made in socialism. And you only see empty greenhouses and deserted land next yeah. to the empty sign. So the, the, the mythology that this was now the people's land and the people's production, but they were producing nothing. That's exactly right. And yeah. because we were producing nothing, and Chavez also implemented something called uh, currency controls in our country, where he fixed the exchange rate with the dollar. Yeah. And by fixing the exchange rate, he could assign, the government actually assigned foreign currency to us. So you could not just trade freely or the, your currency to save in US dollars, bring and invest abroad or bring US dollars to, to home. You could only do it through government authorization for the purposes they thought were right. And by closing our economy that way and stealing all the old revenue because the oil was nationalized, right? And taking also away the food production inside, then we're a closed economy. And we have nothing produced inside, so it's it's just the path to starvation. Yeah. 
So he he started off by using the oil revenues essentially to buy votes, and then he he was, um, as far as I can tell, a very popular guy. He may still well be in Venezuela. Do you think Venezuelans hold him accountable for what they're going through, or is it Maduro's fault? I do think Venezuelans hold Chavez accountable. Um, I think that a lot of people, even by the time Chavez was was almost dead, were against Chavez. And as the country has gone down the drain, because Chavez was the one that appointed Maduro to power, yeah. and Maduro has not done anything differently from Chavez. All the economic policies are the same. Yeah. So when people think that it's just Maduro and not Chavez, they're just trying to deflect from, from the real reason, which is the underlying policies. I want to talk about the policies and necessarily about the person. So huge uh, redistribution of wealth, social programs, um, f- for the working class, for the for the poor people, the the campesinos, and he was using oil revenue to to subsidize an, an extreme growth in government spending, and then because of nationalization, but also because of falling oil prices, that that spigot closed off. I would say that another factor, definitely, oil prices obviously helped. Uh, you know, reduce government revenues. But another important factor was that all that government spending went to hiring government employees that were doing nothing. That, of course, destroyed a private industry. It's very similar to the the guaranteed jobs proposal that we're seeing here in the U.S. Yeah. That's a very uh, scary proposal and that would take us down that path. And we hired millions of government workers to do nothing in ministries like the the Vice Ministry for Supreme Social Happiness. That's that's my favorite one to mention <laughs> because it's just ridiculous, the name. Supreme Social Happiness. They have one about eco-socialism. Uh, they have everything you can imagine. And in addition to that, the, the currency controls, all these policies together, hikes in the minimum wage. I cannot count how many times they have hiked the minimum wage. Just by executive order, 50% increase, 100% increase. Many jobs were destroyed by doing that. Yeah. I, I know business owners who just had to close their business because they couldn't pay the, a minimum wage that was double from one day to the next. So you mentioned uh, uh, currency manipulation. So they're, they're running out of money. The oil revenue is drying up. They, they still need to buy votes. They need to buy peace with the people. And that's when, that's when the seeds of hyperinflation started because eventually, as Margaret Thatcher said, you run out of other people's money and they just started printing money. And because they had cut off um, uh, domestic production of food, without solid money, you couldn't buy imported food. And, and that's, that's really when things got horrific. Yes. And it's not even that the price went down but that the, of oil, but that the production of oil went down. Yeah. And it, the production did not go down because of the price change, but it went down because the government had taken over all the oil production. In While oil production was going down in Venezuela, in the United States it was going up because of the fracking revolution. So it's definitely not about the prices, but about the policies that led to the production to go down. And yes, of course, the government has no more money. There's hyperinflation because they're printing for welfare programs. And all these policies that were supposed to help the poor because there were programs to you know, give them free health care, free food, free housing, ended up just leaving them even poorer. It's, yeah. it's very sad. So this is a gotcha question. Frederick Hayek or Milton Friedman, who's better? Well, I, I'm even though I agree with Hayek on more issues, I'm very biased towards Milton Friedman because he's the one that introduced me to, to the liberty movement. How did you find Friedman? I, I was in my school. By the library. way, there was no wrong answer unless you said you didn't like either one. <laughs> no, no, I mean it. I, I like Hayek. Hayek introduced me to something called uh, to the denationalization of money. I read his his book about yeah. it, and that's how I got introduced into more Austrian monetary theory. But um, Friedman introduced me to the whole liberty movement because I was in my school library in Venezuela. I was probably in eighth grade, and I was looking for books about economics, and they had uh, "Free to Choose" by Milton Friedman. It was in Spanish, "Libre de elegir." And I read it, and I was just thinking, this is these are exactly the policies that Chavez is implementing here: price controls, nationalization. It led to the same thing that Friedman is talking about. And now this is happening to my country. This guy is right on everything. I started watching videos of him on YouTube. I started watching your videos on YouTube. I started watching um, R- Ronald Reagan, and I got introduced to what Ronald Reagan said and uh, how he, patriotic he was about America. And that's how uh, I ended up loving this country too. 
I'm, I'm shocked that you found a copy of Free to Choose in a Venezuelan library. But Yes, uh, I'm they, shocked too. They had yet to burn all of the books. Um, well, and I, I knew what you were going to answer because I've heard you talk about Milton Friedman before, and we're not going to judge here. We're like, I, I think <laughs> we, we allow Friedmanites on the show, but the, uh, the, the reason that I want to, I want to sort of get into the sort of the economic framework because every time that you or I talk about socialism in Venezuela, um, you, you get all these comments from the, the Socialist Party actually trolls me on Twitter. And every time really? I post something, they're like, that's not socialism. <laughs> and they have all these, the, the, all, all these alternative words. They talk about oligarchy and state capitalism and uh, all sorts of things. And, and certainly Latin America has a history of, of, I guess I would call it crony capitalism, but you could call it oligarch capitalism or, or whatever that is. It's not, it's hardly free market. And that's why there's all sorts of problems that led up to opportunists like, like Chavez, but but there is a there is sort of a, a a framework that comes from Hayek and Friedman, and I would add a third economist, James Buchanan, who talked about the self interest of people in power and how that that can corrupt the outcomes when you try to do things through government, and and I don't feel like that's right or left. I don't I don't feel like uh, we should be sort of making that a partisan issue, but there there are fundamental problems whenever it is that you try to centralize so much power in a country. And I feel like Venezuela is sort of like the the poster child for doing everything wrong. Because it's not just that the people in charge don't know what to do, it's that they're um, corruptible, and maybe they they got into power by being corrupt, but inevitably all that, all those resources are diverted towards, you know, Swiss bank accounts and, and, and all sorts of things. So, how do we how do we connect? I mean, you, you spend a lot of time on TV now talking about your personal experience, but but how do we connect with young people that are flirting with this idea of, of democratic socialism? Because Hugo Chavez is a democratic socialist, or at least he started off that way. They always start off that way. Yeah, and undoubtedly in Venezuela we have a regime with people who are evil, who don't care about killing people, who want to stay in power. Yeah. But I think that that's just the ultimate result of those policies initially. I don't think that many socialists or any socialist starts in power by thinking that they're going to start killing people. They think they're going to stay popular forever because their programs are good in their mind. Mm -hmm. And I have no doubt that Chavez thought that his programs were good. Uh, Many of actually the regime members were, you know, trained in Cuba and they were taught about communism, complete Marxist. So I think that they might have their own personal stories that forced him to think those that way. You know, Chavez came from a family uh, where he had his own uh, personal problems and struggles uh, that were not fair for him. And that happens with many dictators. And they, they channeled that resentment into, into these policies. Now, I think that the way to, to try to persuade people in this country that those policies are wrong are by talking about the policies and not necessarily about the, the word. We use a lot the word socialism, and for everybody, that word has has a different meaning. Yeah. And I think that you can see that in polls. If you ask people about the Green New Deal, they agree with the Green New Deal. But then if you ask about the specific policies in the Green New Deal, they're all very unpopular. And I think that that's where we need to focus the conversation. And that's what we see the people who propose those policies, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She just says the Green New Deal. She's not even talking about the underlying policies anymore because the word is popular. We have to debunk that word and not use it anymore. We have to just say, you know, price controls are bad. Free jobs for everybody is, is wrong. People need to earn their way. The government is not, that's not the job of the government. And these policies lead to poverty and we don't want poverty, we want prosperity for everybody. Tell, tell the story. Um, you, were, you were old enough to spend plenty of time trying to acquire basic family goods and food and toilet paper. Um, explain what happens when price controls are are imposed in order to protect consumers. Yeah, the, um, I'm going to give you an example with all the basic goods. So the government wanted milk, toilet paper. They wanted uh, beef, chicken, flour to be nearly free. And to do that, they just forced businessmen to to charge almost nothing. As a result, when I went to the supermarket, 
I had to actually use my fingerprint to buy what I needed, even in pharmacies as well. So I had to put my fingerprint in the, in the where the cashiers, they had fingerprint machines. And they would load my profile and they would see how much I had left in my quota. They, they had to have quotas. They got, this is like 1984. It's, yeah. it's, it's very scary. And when, when they saw my profile, you know, I could buy as many toothpaste per, per, per month or per week. And I, of course, it pissed me off because I don't think the government should be telling me how much I could buy. You know, I wasn't buying for myself alone. I was buying for my mom, for my dad. They, why should they be here when I'm just buying for all of them so that not everybody has to go to the supermarket at the same time? I was even told which days I could go by my uh, ID number with the national ID that we had, the cellula, because mine ended in number one. I could only go to the supermarket on Mondays and Saturdays. Uh, because that's the way the government thought that would be the best way to ration food fairly, quote unquote. They had to ration it because if there's no profit incentive for the business for the business people to actually produce, then they're just not producing. And because they didn't produce, they had to ration it or just a few people would get everything. I think that that's not fair with the poor. I don't think it's fair to force a single mother to have to ration the food that she wants for her children, that she has to work for the government, that she has to depend on people. I don't think it's fair for me that I was just a high school student to have to not be able to go to the supermarket without my parents or that if I forgot my ID, I couldn't get what I needed. And and it's not fair that I, did, I lost my electricity every week because they wanted to give it away for free. At the end, what, what was free became nothing. Everything that the government said it was going to be all right stopped being even ex existent. Everything disappeared. Um, so I think that we, we need to be careful. So the blackouts are worse now, but, but you experienced um, that as well, where you would go without electricity once in a while to yes. all the time. Yes, and now it's even worse. Now, it, more recently, we had a few weeks without electricity. That, that's borderline chaos and anarchy. There were people that because they, they were diabetic and they needed to refrigerate their insulin, yeah, they could not and they lost their insulin and they had to use plants and different diets. Many people died just because of that. That's not fair with the poor if you ask anybody. It's unimaginable to anybody watching this, the idea that you would not have access to electricity for two weeks. Yes. And yet that's normal in Venezuela today. And people are not even thinking too much about it. I talk to my friends very often. I recently had a, actually today I had one hour conversation one hour conversation with a friend that we've been friends since preschool, and he he keeps going. You know, he now sells car parts and uh, he's very entrepreneurial, and I really admire them. He's he's in Venezuela. He's in Venezuela. Okay. He's in Caracas. Yeah, and I really admire them because doing that under those circumstances is so difficult. And that just gives me more hope because it means that without the socialist system that there is right now, imagine what we could do in our country. How, how many entrepreneurs, how many minds we could uh, nourish. Talk, talk about the Venezuelan people because I think, I think there's a lot of misconceptions in this country. Um, not, I don't even think they're malicious, but I think if you haven't been to Latin America or if you haven't been to Europe, if you haven't been here or there, you have some sort of preconceived notion, and and maybe it's the Venezuelan people. Um, you don't buy that, do you? I don't think the Venezuelan people support this <laughs> at all. Yeah. I, nobody does. Uh, very few people support Maduro uh, or these socialist policies. Uh, the Venezuelan people are very hardworking, and they have found out the hard way that voting wrong one time uh, or two times, you know, initially in a few years with with Chavez, uh, ended up in this. And I think that initially it was a good experience to have so that we wouldn't commit the same mistake, but now we can't get out of it democratically. And that's what I'm afraid of for the rest of the world. I don't want the rest of the world to make that mistake. And then when they already learned the lesson, they can't fix it. And I don't think that, uh, I, I think it's a big risk for this country and it's a big risk for the rest of the developed world. It's it's very hard to fix, and in a lot of ways, your you know your grandparents fled Italy and Spain, and there really hasn't been a solid recovery in those countries. They've lived through stagnation and even shrinking populations and shrinking growth. Um, the the point I think 
has to be that that economics is is about people and and I, I feel like we do a, a lousy job of sort of explaining why it is that that economic principles apply to to basic human values like your ability to feed your kids your ability to achieve the things you want to achieve in your life or at least try and and to me those values aren't they're not capitalist or socialist they're they're just people values yeah i i agree i think that you, you see this a lot in latin america that people do anything with what they have and you see people making businesses from their homes and they do everything to get out of poverty and i think that if we just let them we don't mess up with what they're doing we don't try to tax them or we don't try to um you know regulate them they would there's so many people in venezuela who are trying to get out of poverty and they're able to do it but the government just mess up mess up mess ups in their in their way and even in the united states i think that if we go with a message people who are for liberty uh everywhere in the world if we send a message that we're not about you know we're just not against taxes or we're just not against regulation but we are for lifting up barriers for everybody especially people who are poor i think that we can lift up people in this country and i think the country has already done a great job but we can do better yeah yeah we we spend so much time raging against government that that sometimes we forget to talk about the beautiful things that happen when people are free and not just like you know the fact that that in this country um, I actually talked to George. George Will was on the show, and he he has this. It's not really a really de- developed theory, but it's it's one of the sections in his book where he talks about the fact that maybe Americans are um, so angry at each other right now because we're almost in a post scarcity world. We don't think about ever getting in line at the grocery store in hopes of getting bread to feed our kids. It's just yeah. not a thing that Americans care about. We don't wonder if when we flip the light switch on whether or not there's going to be energy because it's a given. And and maybe maybe getting people to appreciate your story is, is part of the answer because these aren't givens. These things don't just happen. They're, they happen because a lot of people worked really hard and a lot of people um, cooperated and, 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 and lifted each other up and, and, and built something. I think about it every day. Every day when I walk on the street, when I was walking here, uh, I think I'm not afraid in the street of a cr- criminal just coming up and killing me or kidnapping me, uh, which is what happens in Venezuela. I could not have a normal childhood in Venezuela. Uh, you cannot go around walking in Venezuela in the street in Caracas, the city with the highest murder rate in the world, without being afraid of being killed or being robbed. And I am able to do that here, even yeah. though, of course, there's cities with more crime here in the U.S., but it's really nothing compared to, to what I lived through in Venezuela. And honestly, I, I sometimes mock that a little bit because for me, even Chicago is like a paradise and people complain about Chicago. I'm like, oh, come on, you haven't lived in Caracas, you know? Um, and it's not just crime, but it's, it's the electricity, you know? It's not having to worry about stockpiling food because you won't find that in the supermarket. It's just think, oh, you know, I don't have flour now. I'll just walk to Kroger or I'll just walk to Giant and buy it now. That I'm able to do that here, and it's a privilege. I think these things are linked together. And I remember, it must have been three years ago now, just when you were fleeing and and things started to get really bad in the streets of Caracas, I remember seeing a video. Um, some guy had stolen the equivalent of $5, and the, the crowd circled around him, uh, cut him up, doused him in gasoline, and set him on fire. And I'm like, what? is happening to people there and it's it's very much related to the fact that people can't get food people don't have a place to live like all of these economics apply to whether or not people are going to treat other people with with basic civility it becomes kind of an animal farm thing or something yes it becomes you see people fighting for food in supermarkets with my mom and i when we've been in the supermarket we've had to fight like you get into this caution, not fight, like fist fight. Thankfully, we haven't gotten, we didn't get into that, but we could have gone into that. Just yelling at each other because, no, you know, I got this or I got this first or, or things like that. And, and it's a shame. You shouldn't have to fight for food. Yeah. And that's what socialism led to in Venezuela. We had to fight for food. Yeah. Uh, and this, this poor guy that got killed, he shouldn't have. 
uh, it's because we didn't have a justice system that, that took care of things. So people started thinking that they had to take justice in their own hands. Yeah. And when you don't have a proper justice system, it happens what happens in Venezuela. Well, let's go there because Maduro has um, sort of outsourced some of the most violent uh, implementation of his of his discipline, like uh, protesters in particular. You know, the, there's these roving gangs of colectivos, and they're they're really working for Maduro, but they're separate. Um, and of course, the government has all the guns because there was very strict gun control laws and. And even even just a couple of years ago, there was this big push to collect the guns as a way to stop crime in the streets. Mm-hmm. And all it, all it did was monopolize crime with with the Maduro forces. Um, right now, it's pure violence. The only way that Maduro stays in power is by killing people, by killing his own citizens. We 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 now see these pictures on the news of of government uh, armored vehicles just running people down. Um, Give us a sense for that and, and give us some hope. How do we get out of this mess? Yeah. Well, for I, I want to also say that I'm a big advocate of the Second Amendment here, and I think it's so great because Venezuela shows the Second Amendment is not just about self-defense, but it is about protecting you from tyranny. And that's the goal that the Second Amendment had initially, and that's what we, what, what we actually needed in Venezuela. And yes, Maduro stays in power because of violence. And I don't think we can get Maduro with negotiations. You don't negotiate with a guy where you can't give him anything in return, right? He has nothing to gain from negotiating with us except time. So if he engages in negotiations, it's because it only prolongs his stay and it gives people hope of not having to leave the country because it might lead to something. There are many news about how Guaido's uh, democratic government has negotiated with him and just, you know, they might plan to do an election with him in power. And that would just be a sham election because Maduro is still controlling the, the guns. He can just force people to vote for whoever he wants or change the result. I think that Venezuela will need more international support. Unfortunately, if, and or, or fortunately, I think that we, ha- we have had a lot of support. And I think that the Trump administration's latest, latest actions with the embargo are definitely helping because Maduro is really having a hard time Uh, importing uh, oil uh, or exporting his oil and giving it to Cuba and obtaining the revenue. He has had had to get help from the Russians. But the drug trafficking is still there. That's his other main source of of revenue. And until we are able to guarantee the regime of Maduro that they're going to have a safe exit, including the United States and Guaido, that they're going to have a safe exit and they're not going to be persecuted, unfortunately. It's what might need to happen. I don't think we're going to be able to get them out. And they also need to have a huge consequence of staying because they can also stay and keep stealing money. How do we change that equation, that incentive? I think that the Trump administration and I think the White Dust government need to coordinate together and actually give a real threat to Maduro that, you know, if you don't leave by this date and we'll guarantee you safe exit. If you don't leave by this state, there's going to be consequences. And those consequences are going to be coordinated with Colombia, with Brazil, and we will capture you and we will jail you. So um, Rand Paul was on this show a couple weeks ago, and he pointed out that um, even though the average Venezuelan has lost 20 pounds, I think it was just in 2017 alone, but um, there's only so much weight you can lose before you starve to death. Um, Nicolas Maduro is insanely fat. Yes. And I, I think that's a beautiful metaphor for, for socialism in practice because um, regardless of your economic system, there's always going to be rich people. And we in this country, we, we're very worried about Jeff Bezos and, and, and all of these, these multi-zillionaires. But there is a political class in Venezuela today that does extremely well. I think uh, that is it still true that the, the richest person in Venezuela is Hugo Chavez's daughter? Yes, and she's actually living in New York City. Yeah. She's the envoy to the United Nations of Maduro. She's living large. Uh, yes. I hope that that's one of the things the Trump administration really needs to do. They really need to stop that from being from allowing them and just taking her because she's a criminal. She's she's taken I think it's over a billion dollars what she has. It's it's just exorbitant amounts and she's never worked in her so life. So socialism works? It works for her. Yeah. Right, it works for her. Um 
I think that you really have to have no sense of human rights or, or compassion to steal that money and right. then and then think that there's no consequences. Yeah. But yes, it, socialism has created a huge political class, which in Venezuela we call enchufados, which means they're plugged in, they're plugged to the system, and that's how they became rich. And everybody who has like a new car in Venezuela needs to be an enchufado. Yeah. I, imagine that you have to be politically connected and go, uh, corrupt government official to buy a car. That's what the the system of socialism made in Venezuela. Yeah. So it's the, the irony of socialism, and, and we will wrap up on this, the irony of socialism is that they've created a whole new class of haves and more have-nots, and it's, it's the uh, perverse opposite of what um, Chavez promised. He promised to lift up the people, but instead he's created an untouchable class of people who have all the power, and now they have all the money, and they have all the guns, and it's it just... I can't imagine that any sane person would support a system that inevitably leads to that sort of abuse of power. And I think they don't. And we need to continue. And I think we will be able to persuade most Americans that that's that's not a, a correct system. And we need to continue proposing alternatives. I think Venezuela will eventually obtain its freedom. And I hope it will be sooner rather than later. Uh, because the poverty that socialism creates is very, very, very difficult to, to solve in, in, in a short period of time. But the potential that we have is huge. And definitely, if we are able to put free markets in Venezuela, uh, we're going to be able to get out of this. And, and I think that that's the, the moral of the story. Free markets lead to prosperity. Uh, and socialism always leads to poverty. And that's what happened in my country. That's why I had to leave. That's why my grandparents left Europe, and now they left again Venezuela. Uh, it's a story of oppression, and socialism is oppression. We're going to leave it there. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Matt. Oh, sure. yeah. <laughs>